this series called The Truth About. And in this series, we have, last week we talked about the right way to speak, didn't we? And in this series, or this one today, is how God rewards. It's how God rewards. Now, how many here didn't know that God rewards us? Did you know there's a lot of Christians that have no idea that God rewards? And did you know that God rewards you in this life and the life to come? So if he rewards you in this life, I'm going to quote a couple of scriptures for you. And the life to come, we need to know how to get rewarded properly. Also, you might not know, but there are ways in which we cannot get rewarded. Did you know that? God rewards his, his, his church. He rewards his children. But he also, listen, he rewards those that do good in the world. If you've got a good dictator who has a good nation and chose to, like Cyrus, chose to favor the Israelites, then he did something good and God rewarded him. So the world gets rewarded for good, gets punished for bad. You as a Christian get rewarded for good and get nothing when you blow it. Now you say, what do you mean, Pastor Kerry? What I mean is you don't get punished. When you do something out of the wrong motive, out of the wrong reason, hurry up, guys. And when you do it out of the wrong reason, then there is no score. Everyone say, how many's ever been out doing some maybe putt-putt golfing? And you were like me, the first time you played, you couldn't get that ball in that little hole if you wanted to. <coughs> and the score you would get was so bad, it's just like getting nothing. Amen? And I don't know about you, but God wants us to be rewarded for the good that we do. Can you say amen? So let me give you some things that says we can be rewarded in this life, okay? Hebrews 11, 6, I'll quote it for you. It says that he that cometh to God must believe that he is. How many here believe God is? And that he's a rewarder, now listen carefully, of them that diligently Seek him. See, rewarder of those that diligently seek God. So that's talking about now. How about you? How was your prayer time this morning? What did God say to you? You see, when you do that, he rewards you. Hello. All right, here's another one. The Bible says that when you pray, go into your prayer closet and shut the door. And meet with your father in secret. So when he sees and meet with you in secretly, he will reward you openly. In fact, I used to have a little prayer person who used to pray for me all the time. And what an honor. She came to me, Beulah. She came to me and she said, Pastor, God has laid it on my heart to pray for you every day so that the enemy doesn't punch your lights out. <laughs> That's what she said. And that the enemy doesn't harass you or cause problems in the church. So I'm going to just, every day in my prayer time, I'm going to make sure I spend at least 20 minutes praying just over you and over the things that God wants to do through you. In leadership, it says, first of all, pray for those in authority. You see what I'm saying? And so God put it on her heart to do that. And this lady would pray for me and pray for me and pray for me. And, it, 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 and it's such a wonderful thing to be clothed in God's rewards through prayer. Can you say amen? So he says, when you pray, go in, meet with God, and people will be able to see that God's favor is on you because of the rewards. He rewards you openly. Say amen. I'm going to say this because God just put it on my heart to say it. Anything that you hide, that you try to keep secret because you don't want anybody to know, God will expose. Everything that you expose to God, he will cover. Are you getting this? Okay. So if you're open and honest in God in your prayer meeting, 
with God and say, Lord, man, I have a problem telling stories a little bit. I'm just making this up. Could you help me with that? Then God covers you with grace and rewards you. But if you run around and you try to pretend you're a Christian and you're doing all this and you're all that and you're causing harm and hurt, and God's going to expose you because you're harming his people, his children. Can you say amen? Now, I said that because if you want God's favor on you in this life, as well as the life to come, then you need to make sure that you're open and honest. That's what I appreciated about President Trump. You knew exactly where he was going, where he was headed, and talk about candidacy and purity and being open. Oh, yeah, you might not have liked habits and different things. You know what? But that man was a man of God. God put him in there to help us. Now, why do we always kill the people that come to help us? So we as the church, we need to get to a place of maturity. So God rewards us. Let's find out how. So good morning to this briefing. I'm glad you're here. Amen. Remember this old story that God told me a long time ago. He says, when the word is pure... And it comes out like a fountain and it blesses you and gives you answers to prayer. Satan's going to try to keep you from coming to church. He'll never stop you from coming to a church where you're not going to get much. All you're going to get is loved on by the people that are there and have sort of a, a little party hearty. But when you come to get the word, it's going to change your life and it's going to change the world around you. Satan doesn't like that. So I used to really, really cry out to God and say, God, why is the enemy harassing this little church so bad? And he says, because I, you preach my word, son. The ones that don't preach my word, they're already in trouble. Why should, I, why should the devil harass them? Now, listen to me. I'm not a person that picks on other churches. But listen, if you go to church and all you are, are being done or what's been given to you is a newspaper article and the points concerning how bad that is, that's not the word. <laughs> and if I got up here and I preached, you better do this and you better do that. And if you don't, God's going to get you. That's not the word either. That's the law. And the law killeth. But the Spirit gives what? So we're going to give you the means whereby you can be rewarded. And folks, in this life, this is where you need a little steak on the plate while you wait. You need answers to prayer today, right? Not just later on. So how does God reward us? All right, so let's look at this. Today we're going to look at what the Scripture says about how God rewards those who do good. We were created for God and to populate the earth, to flourish and to thrive. Say flourish, flourish. and thrive. Flourish. Are you flourishing? Are you thriving? If not, let's go for it. Because God is right there with you to see that you flourish. You see, when we flourish, people get blessed. When we don't flourish, we don't even get blessed. So when you hang out to the flourished one, the God who gives all things and does not withhold, and the more time we spend with him, the more we flourish and people see that God's hand and favor is on you. Are you with me? We live in a fallen planet, folks, and I, can help, I can't help but see the humor in God. Alan, think of this. Here God picks you out, loves on you, and blesses you right in the face of the devil. And Alan's singing and praising and, and giving God glory, and the devil's going, man, I can't irritate that Alan guy. The purpose is, if we let God in us do the work and do the leading, there is not a spirit in this earth that can hinder you or keep you from being blessed of God. Hello. How many's ever used the mail? You got regular mail and then you got overnight mail 
And then you got the fast mail. I don't know how they do that, but they, they got different speeds of mail, right? Well, you got the best speed. You got the Jesus speed for blessings. Can you say amen? You got the special delivery stamped on you. Amen. Now, if you're looking at yourself, you won't feel worthy of anything. But if you're looking at the Lord, God says, come with me. And so the scripture tells us that he wants to give us a tour on how things works, how things work in the kingdom of God. You with me? Okay, let me just go ahead and read this to you. All right. But you and I now have Jesus Christ on the inside of us, correct? God is for us, right? God is with us, Emmanuel, right? And we're in God. So if God is in us, God is for us, God is with us, and we are in God, where's the devil at? He's out here trying to get our attention. Can you say amen? Maybe you did for a moment or two this morning. Hello? Amen. So let's go on. Being have, we have God on the inside of us. God wants us fully equipped for every good work. So let's find out what the scripture says. All right. Jesus Christ is God. Is that right? He went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. Acts 10.38. How God was with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. How he went about doing good. Doing what? And healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Now, let me ask you, where does Jesus dwell now? And if we let him, he'll go about with you to do good and to heal those who've been oppressed of the devil. Is Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever? Amen. Then let God out. Can you say amen? Amen. Acts, again, 10, 38, 39 says, How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Going about doing good. Amen. And healing all those that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Is God with us? Are you indwelt by God? Is God for you? Is God with you? Are you in God? So, go into the world and preach the good news. The good news to the sick is God doesn't want you sick. The good news to the poor is God doesn't want you not to be able to pay your bills. He wants you to be able to pay your bills. And not get up in the morning and be concerned who's going to call you on the phone and say, no do, hello, amen? Oh, by the way, you watch some of those crank calls. We get two or three of them a week. How the FBI is going to shut down your, you know, your social security number was the last one we got. Your social security number has been hacked. Right. I don't need you to tell me. <laughs> so I had, a, I had a friend a long time ago, and he would always buy into these things. He was a very lonely man. I'm going to just take a minute to explain this. And so he gets this little notice on his phone that says this woman from Nigeria is looking for a male to come and rescue her, and she will be a devoted wife. All he signs up and sends her 500 bucks. <laughs> so him and I had a nice talk. Was it six months later? Computer notice came on. Your computer's been hacked. You got to get a hold of us for this program, blah, 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 and you got to send us $600. <laughs> Folks, why am I bringing this up? Because when you find the enemy giving you temptations and trying to slide in that way, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. He's nervous, he's upset. Your, your life is getting in order. You're coming together. He's got to do something to get you scattered and all frazzled again. Sounding familiar? But what you and I need to know is how God rewards us. 
All right? First scripture, please. Let's find out, again, why we were created. This is in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10. We are created for good works. Say good works. Now, when God had completed his creation, folks, what did he say? When God created the heavens and the earth, he said it is good. When he made the animals, he said it was good. When he made the heavens and the firmaments, and he said it was what? And when he made man, he said, uh-oh, no. <laughs> he said it was what? Good. Now, here's, here's the Hebrew for it. The word good in the Hebrew means wholesome, healthy, perfect, and secure. So when God said, my creation is healthy, perfect, and secure, it is good. All right, so let's see what God is doing in our life. Ephesians chapter 2, listen. For by grace you have been saved. Aren't you glad you didn't earn it? Through faith. You have faith in God. We meet with God through faith. And that, not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. Now listen to this. Not of works. Remember Cain and Abel? Say, so I'll never forget Cain and Abel. Because it runs through the whole Bible, see. Cain brought works. Abel brought faith. Which one did God pay attention to? Abel. When you come to God, do you bring works? I've been a Sunday school teacher for 40 years, God. You've got to bless me. No, we don't bring him works. Lord, I just bring you myself and I believe in you, Lord. Boom! That's how quick it happens. You see, if we bring a work, we get the credit. And God does not get the credit. And he won't share credit with a fallen creature like ourselves. Now, he redeemed us and he gave us the gift of salvation. But it's not on our own credit, not our own ability to do so. He gave it as a gift. And he says, let me fill your heart with good works and good things right in the face of the devil. And let me reward you and set a table for you. You come and eat and enjoy yourself. We're supposed to be enjoying our Christianity. Folks, let me warn you, though. God just spoke this to me. He says, some of us like to try to help everybody. Stop it. If you're not getting all the help you need, then you don't need to be helping everybody else. Babies, young people, don't produce adults. Adults produce adults. So if you're young and you're learning about all this, don't try to rescue everybody. Look at your neighbor and say, he is talking to you. Say it. Don't try to rescue these people. You, first thing you do, remember, somebody, maybe your best friend, maybe it's a relative, maybe somebody that really, really needs help and you might have the answer. You've got to go to God and you say, God, do you want me to say anything? Do you want me to do anything or just pray? You've got to get that wisdom. Why? Because we could mean well, but do it wrong. So young people, don't try to fix everybody. Sit under the word and get fixed and help where God leads you, but don't overcommit yourself. It will stop you from growing. Someone say, oh me. It's an amen. I'm trying to help you. I was the fixer. I got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I was going to fix everybody's problem. You know how much trouble I got into doing that? Especially when you try to fix somebody's problem when they don't ask you. Come on now. I'm just trying to be a good pastor to you. All right, so let's get this thing. You were created, okay, for good works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. Say, I'm God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. God rewards good works. Now we need to find out what good works really are. Can you say amen? 
doing something well is not necessarily a good work. Doing something not so well, but doing it out of love for God and love for others will get a higher score than somebody doing something perfect just so they can notice. So the way God rewards us is far different the way that we think sometimes we should be rewarded. So you with me? All right. So God created us for good works. Remember, Cain killed Abel because he was jealous and Satan filled his head with jealousy. Cain's works were evil because he did them out of the flesh, not out of faith. And we see throughout the Bible, works versus faith. Faith works versus works. The Israelites, what did they serve God with? Works. That's why when somebody like Jesus, the Messiah, shows up, they didn't recognize him. Because he wasn't working hard at all. He wasn't following all of their rules. Jesus was just fulfilling all scripture, healing all kinds of people, and they got jealous. Cain will always get jealous of Abel. Now everybody pinch your flesh a little. This is Cain. Don't trust yourself. Huh? Drug addicts. We can't trust ourselves. So I don't get around drugs. Hello? And people have problems. Why? Because the flesh is always got to get its fix. Now, it might not be a drug. It could be food. I remember a long time ago when I got upset, I would raid the refrigerator. Moving right past that. <laughs> and I look like one at the end. <clears throat> but we need to know that when we sow good works, it comes from our heart. Can you say amen? And not to be noticed from our flesh. So let's go through this. So never forget Cain and Abel. Number two, God is making us into the image of his son. And the expression of that image through his son, we are his workmanship. So to, to see something, a good artist, when he's like chiseling out a statue... Or a good artist, when they're painting maybe a, um, a portrait or maybe a still of some sort, they look at what they're painting and then they transfer it. You follow what I'm saying? Well, folks, as long as we're looking outside of ourselves, we won't see clearly what God has put inside of us to see Jesus. We have Jesus inside of us. So it doesn't make any sense at all to say, God, send the power. Pentecostals failed at that, so miserable. God, send the power. And God says, where am I going to get anymore? You got the power on the inside of you, and you've been ignoring me all this time. He says, don't say who will go up into heaven, and that is to bring Christ down. Hello? Send the power, God. And God says, hey, pay attention. <laughs> and then somebody go down into hell who's going to bring Christ up from the dead and we got the other opposite Jesus is still on the cross no Jesus lives in your heart and he is ready to put you over right in the face of the devil if you will let him I get excited about this this is really exciting. Now, the third thing I want to share with you is even God, when he was done, he said, it is good. When you got up this morning and you said hello to God, you say, Lord, this is the day the Lord hath made, and I will choose to rejoice in it no matter what. You see? Then when you set your mind on him, set your mind on things above, it says, then God works those things in you for good and starts rewarding us. Can you say amen? I mean, wow. Can I tell you one more little quick story? Um, back in the day when, when I was serving the Lord and I had some trouble, I was young, green under the ears, and Satan set me up, you know, and I had some problems and 
hey, if you want to know my history, come sit down with me and I'll tell you all about it. The thing that people do all the time is they, they always want to hear the gossip about what happened and they never want to talk to the person. And that's really, I'm really sorry about that because I had no one come talk to me about it. And yes, everybody gets set up. Satan sets us up. If you think he's not going to try to set you up, then maybe you're not doing anything for Jesus. But he will set everybody up. And what makes us think that leaders are an untouchable? He comes at us first. And, and so in my whole situation, so after God restored me and I started preaching again, it was a hard roll back, believe me. It really was. Because once people hear that you might have made a mistake, some people will never forgive you. Did you know that? They should, but they just won't let it release, you know. And they're always keeping the back of their mind. Ooh, ooh. Hello? That's stupid. How are we ever going to have revival if we keep doing stupid stuff like that? And so anyway, what God did with me is I, I said, Lord, what do I need to do to get back to what you're doing in my life? He says, you don't need to do anything, son, but be humble. Be humble and talk with me a lot. I'll bring you to restoration. That's my job. You do your job, I'll do my job. Oh, what's my job? Be humble. So here's what happens. God will give you favor even if you don't feel like you deserve any. One time I was thinking about entering into the ministry. And I was going to leave this large church. I won't mention any names. It's the biggest one in Puyallup. Okay, and they wanted me to be on staff and I says no God's got something else he wants me to do he wants me to preach and teach uh, and uh, being under a ministry is good but if God didn't tell you to do it don't do it and so I was telling the pastor because I believe that you talk to the pastor and I went, so I made an appointment with the pastor at Starbucks and I said I'm going to be leaving the church but it's not anything that you did not anything that, that you are or anything. I just feel God has called me and always called me into the ministry. And that for a while there, I felt unworthy of anything of it, just to serve somewhere. It says, but now God says, it's time. So I'm, now I'm going to do it. And this is how God works. This pastor is well known, a wonderful man. Please don't get anything negative. But, but God doesn't go on how wonderful we are. He goes on how faithful we've been. Come on, say amen. amen. How faithful you've been. Amen. Okay? He rewards the crown of faithfulness, it says. Okay? It's consistency, faithfulness is the key. So, I have been saved a lot longer than this pastor. And I, of course, I don't even believe I was barely saved. And I just wanted to serve. I was just on fire. No longer, you know, in a spotted life. And this guy I had led to the Lord a long time ago, which was a missionary and traveled all around, shot camera for CBN and all that kind of stuff. Well, he's an old friend of mine. I hadn't seen him in years. He was also at the Starbucks. So I'm trying to tell this pastor, God is moving me on. It's not anything you do. I want to honor you. Thank you, pastor. Please keep us in your prayers and everything. And so this guy I knew from years ago come walking up and he looks at this very famous pastor and puts his finger in his face. He says, you better listen to Pastor Kerry because he knows his stuff. <laughs> what am I going to do? And this pastor, I mean, this pastor is world famous. What is the guy saying? This in front. And, and the guy got so up, this pastor got so upset, he forgot his computer. He had to leave. It was all like that. And so I talked to him later on, and he thought I had staged that and brought that guy up just to let him know it was okay for me to leave. No, I'll tell you who did it, though. He did it. He will always back you. You stay humble. You stay obedient. And he'll fill your heart with good things. And you'll be doing things for God. It'll absolutely amaze you. And you'll go, well, Lord, how did that happen? He says, you got out of my way, stayed humble, and I did the work. Wow. 
I could tell you dozens of times that happened. Dozens. And you'll say, well, why does that happen? Because God rewards his children. And no one can take your reward from you. Can you say amen? All right, so let's get into the lesson. All right, Titus 2, please. Verses 6 through 8 says, Likewise, I exhort you, you young men. Everybody that's young, put your hand. You young men, listen. Be sober-minded. In all things, show in yourself to be a pattern. Listen, a pattern of good works. We're supposed to be known by our good works, not by our money. Can you say amen? We're supposed to be known by our good works, not by something else. And then it goes on. Be a pattern of good works. And in doctrine, in teaching, showing in, in integrity, reverence, uncor incorruptibility, sound speech so people can't accuse you. And it says that no one, or excuse me, that the one who is the opposes, oh, boy, I messed that one up. When people oppose you, they should be ashamed having nothing to accuse you by. That's how our walk should be. Full of good works. Amen. Now, folks, don't worry about making mistakes. As long as you're not going to purposely go out there and hurt somebody, making mistakes is already covered under your contract. You're a little boo-boo. You're daddy's pet. When you make a mistake, he picks you up and he loves on you. That is, if you don't throw yourself back on the ground, have a tantrum. That's how he loves us. Now, why does he reward good works? So well, let's look at this. All right. Faith in God produces good works. Go with me to James chapter 2, please. Faith in God produces good works. And I know you have faith in God. Verse 17, please. James 2, 17 says, Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works that correspond, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my love for God or my faith by my works. Pretty self-explanatory, right? We're supposed to do good works. You believe that there is one God. How many here believe there's one God? Right? You do well. Even the demons believe. Did you know that? The demons believe there's one God. The difference is, we love God, they're afraid of him. So here's what was going on. There was a lot of people saying, oh, I'm a Christian, but they'll never come to church. I love the Lord, but you never see them doing any good thing. So they're talking about God with what? Their words only. You honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. What Jesus is trying to say is, don't tell me you're a Christian. I should be able to watch your life and the things you do should testify of him. Say amen. So if we just say we're a Christian, but we don't have works that follow through on it, then guess what? Our faith is dead. It has no substance to it. Let's read on. You believe that there is one God, so do the devils. And they tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, now he's not calling us a fool, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Okay, see, I got that point. So to, I say to this to you, have faith, but let your works show you love God. Amen. Right? Some people, they're up in age, so what do they do? They show that they love God by sending out birthday cards and welcome to the church things. They can't necessarily go to, from house to house or, or do things that active, but there are things that you can do that is a good work. Can you say amen? 
All right, so to say that you have faith, but you don't have any actions that show it is really a silly thing. All right, here's another thing. To say we believe in God, but don't act on the word, therefore, it becomes what we call mental assent. Everyone say mental agreement. Mental assent. That's somebody who says, yeah, I believe I can get healed. But they don't have any works or faith showing that they want to get healed. It's just a confession. Amen? I believe in God. Well, the devils believe in God. What in our life shows that we believe in God? So now you understand that works do have their place. Works are rewarded. But works never lead faith. Faith, faith, works follow faith. Got to get my eye tooth to work over my tongue so I can see what I'm saying. All right. So, because of the love for God that you and I have, we desire to do good things. Doing good is just a part of what we do. Can you say amen? Because Jesus went about doing good and healing, right? Where does he live? In you. And if you let him do that, he'll lead you to good things. You'll be walking around, all of a sudden God will tell you, do this for them. Do this for this such and such. And you do. And they go, oh, this is so wonderful. How did you know to do that? God, you did a good work. You obeyed God. And something great came out of it. I mean, what sweat off your brow did you do? You didn't dig a ditch, you know. You didn't drive 5,000 miles. You simply obeyed God and did a good work. And every good work gets rewarded. Say amen. Every good work gets rewarded. For a Christian, every work that's not so good just gets neutralized. You know, you go out there and you hurt somebody and it didn't mean to and you said you were sorry. God neutralizes it. Takes the effect away. Hello? But here's how Satan works. You think you offended somebody. Happens to me quite often. And so you go back and say, I didn't offend you, did I? Did I offend you? No! You see, we don't want to offend anybody, do we? But for a person to think they offended somebody... And to think that person that they think they offended is mad at them, and yet having never asked that person would be a trick of the enemy, wouldn't it? Don't do that. Listen, people that have, are going to offend other people, no matter what, you could laugh too hot, loud, and somebody get offended by it. What, now you don't laugh? You see? You be you, and you be the best person Filled with God, you, you can be. And if it offends somebody, that's their problem. But if you go out and purposely offend someone, that's your problem. And now we have to deal with it. Can you say amen? All right, don't, don't lose. We want to make sure you get the best rewards for the best things that you do. Can you say amen? Some of you got some rewards coming. Can you say amen? And about the time God's going to hand it to you, he, the enemy distracts you and you walk off. The, the blessings are waiting right there. We've got to get you right back to a place of receiving them. Say amen. All right, catch me. The value of good works. Did you know there's value of good works? 1 Corinthians 3, please. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 through 15, we're going to see this in a minute. But let me read this scripture. This is Titus 3.12. It said, let our people also learn, that's us, to maintain good works, to meet urg urgent needs, and that they may be fruitful in what they do. Say amen. That's you. All right, so look at how do we get rewarded? Now, couple of points I want to make you. What does the Bible say about our God? Our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29. Say, my God's a consuming fire. When Moses went up into the mountain. No, you don't have to say that part. <laughs> you know, say amen, somebody. Say amen, somebody. 
Obedience is good, but blind obedience is not. All right, so I'm just joking with you. So when Moses went up and saw the burning bush, what was it doing? It was burning, but not being consumed. The fire is God. Can you say amen? God burns up the chaff in our life, but we have to come to God on a daily basis so we can burn that chaff up. A consuming fire in us. How many know that the things that we do will have to be measured by the things that God has done through his son? That's why it says that we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account thereof of the things that we've done in our body, whether they be good or whether they be bad. So my word to you before we go on is that would make it your choice that you're going to be good with God's help. Can you say amen? And he's going to help you. Even when you catch yourself getting a little irritated and things starting to bother you a bit, just stop. Say, God, fill my heart with the peace. Take that time. Here's another thing. I noticed this. Maybe you did too. Have you noticed that sometimes when you're doing a little project, there's something in you that wants to get you to hurry up It's almost as if there's a little bit of anxiety. And I noticed this with my walking. To get from here over to there takes a certain amount of time. But if I'm focused on how far I have to walk, then I want to hurry up. And that's possibly why you fall. You're trying to hurry up to get somewhere you don't need to hurry up to get. I noticed that this morning. That it seemed like I had to hurry up and do this and hurry up and do that. And yet I had all this extra time. Now, let me see the hands of those that sense that. Every hand should go up. There are times that it seems a little anxiety tries to push us. But we know who that is. Can you say amen? Like, you'll lose your joy going to church because you have to hurry up. Who's doing that? Yeah, the flesh, our flesh and the enemy work in the flesh. So to to avoid a lot of that is you got to spend that time where you get in with God in the morning. So no matter what happens, you can just smile at it and know God has it. You don't have to get all nervous. Oh, it's got to be just right. People get nervous about setting up the church. Why don't you do it on a Saturday night? So your Sunday morning, you can just relax. All right, moving right past that. <laughs> See, I used to be, and this is, I'm going to tell them, I used to be what you call a system analyst. Do you know what that is? How many here don't know what that means? System analyst will take somebody doing their task, And we'll watch that person and show them how to do it better, quicker, faster, and with more time to spare. That's what a system analyst does. How many's ever read the book Cheaper by the Dozen? Oh, read it. My word, you're missing a good book. Because that man had 12 kids. And by a system analyzation, he could get them all bathed, all taken care of. By working out the system and making it flow in a good manner. But what we do is we just, case sirrah, sirrah. What we'll flop about, we'll flop about. Hello? And we don't system analyze anything. Get up in the morning and meet with God. God's going to stretch our time. He's going to expand our, our lack of stress. And we're going to be walking in peace. Isn't that worth the 10, 15 minutes of meeting with God first? Then be in a hurry. Oh, I just can't pray with you, God. I'm in a hurry to get to my appointment. I'm in a hurry to get things done. Oh, I rush and rush until life's no fun. All I really got to do is live and obey because I'm always in the way. Can you say amen? So, amen. I love country songs. So let's go on past this. First Corinthians 3. For we are God's fellow workers. You see, we're, we're for good works. Say amen. amen. Then he says, 
You are God's what? Field. God puts seed in the field. Can you say amen? And then he calls you, you are God's building. Wow. So we are workers, we're a field, and we're a building. Sure looks weird to me. <laughs> workers means that we sow and we reap good things. Can you say amen? Being a field means that God can sow good things in our field and others can sow good things in our field. And being a building, the Bible says we're living stones built up a spiritual house to offer up spiritual sacrifices holy and acceptable to God. So you're workers, you're a field, you're builders. Now look what he says. According to the grace given to me, Paul says, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. Who's the foundation for our feet? Jesus. He's the rock, right? How do we stand on the rock? You hear the word and do the word. He that heareth my sayings and does them, I'll show you. To whom he is like, he's like a man who dug deep, built his house, and laid it upon a rock. When the floods come and the winds blow, he beats upon that house, but he cannot shake it. Why? Because it's founded on the rock. And we know the other is founded on the sand. And like I, I met a man that sometime years ago, loved the Lord, but he went out and bought all this fancy equipment and everything like that, assuming that he was going to get involved in the ministry. And God had other plans for him. So he had about $100,000 worth of equipment that he went and bought out and didn't ask God if he wanted him to or not. How do we do things like that? We assume. No, no. We need to be careful how we build upon the foundation which is laid. Can you say amen? Now, Paul is giving his best teaching here. He's trying to show us. Now, I'm going to say this. This teaching that I'm giving you today sobered me up when I was a young Christian because it let me know that God is monitoring everything I say, do, how I act, how faithful I am. He's monitoring it all and going to reward me accordingly. And so what it did with me, it says, well, Lord, just the whole idea is knowing that I, there's a lot of stuff I need work on. He says, yeah, but I reward you on your effort to obey those things, not on your ability to do them perfectly. So if I called you to preach, Carrie, if you were just attempting to preach, even if you were as clumsy about it as all, you are doing what I want you to do rather clumsily, but I reward your faithfulness. You see the difference? Now, if I disobeyed and I took off like Jonah did, <laughs> I'm liable to get swallowed by a whale, Alan. In fact, some of you have been spit up a couple of times because you're doing your own thing. All right, let's move on past that. Yeah, I thought I, I, thought I had something hanging off me. Amen. Are you guys here? Do you guys laugh any? Oh, that gospel is so serious. No, it, what it is is God is so in love with you, but you are so seriously about the wrong things. We need to turn and be serious about good works. Can you say amen? All right, so let's see. So he goes on. And so no one can build on any other foundation. And if they build on it, listen, okay, the other foundation then Jesus Christ. So we have to build on who? What's the name of this church? Do you know now why it's Christ-centered ministries? God gave me a vision, folks. Told me what to name it. Told me what he would do with it. And he did that when I had my first grandchild. And of course, my wife was in with her daughter having a grandchild. I was asleep on the waiting room and God gave me that dream. Old men shall dream dreams and name this. He says, I want you in the last days to tell everybody to focus on me. I'm the captain of their salvation. If anybody was going to get them out of here, I'm the one. Yes, Lord. Amen. Obedience. 
is better than sacrifice. God doesn't need our money nor prayers of ice. What he needs from you and I is to follow what he declares. Hello, I'm over here, kids. Oh, <laughs> all right. Oh, man, I done preached myself happy. Okay, let's go on and listen to this. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, listen, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw or stubble, each one's work, say work, will become clear. Why you're doing it, for whom you're doing it, the reason why you're doing it will become clear. Can you say amen? Notice it says gold, silver, precious stone. When you put fire on gold, what happens? It melts and then it becomes pure, right? Same with silver. What happens when you put fire on stones? They blacken, but they don't deteriorate, do they? They be polished right back up. So stones are the least of your works. Silver is the 60% of your works. And the gold is the 100% of your works. 30, 60, 100 fold. It's all them threes. So when you do a work, if it's golden, because your heart's pure, you're loving God and loving people, then you will get a gold reward. If it's silver, where there's a mixture of you and a mixture of God, you're a little reluctant, but you did it anyway, you're going to get a silver reward. Now, I'm just using this for understanding. You're not going to get a silver ribbon. <laughs> and then if you did a work, but you were kind of very hesitant, kind of complained along the deal, then it's like a, a valuable stone that gets tarnished with your flesh when you complain. But nevertheless, every one of those works will remain. Can you say amen? But the wood, when it's exposed to fire, does what? So if you did a work for the wrong reason because you wanted to prove to everybody you could do it, you're going to have a, a barbecue. I'm just trying to show us some sobering teaching. I'm all about giving you the goods, okay? So this is a sobering teaching. This really opened my eyes. So how about straw and stubble? We got wood, hay, and, and straw or stubble, right? Well, what does straw do with fire? It really goes up. And then stubble is the stuff you start fires with when you're like a Boy Scout or something. You know, the little kindling stuff. Hello. So if we do a work, because you want to tell God you're special, you're going to have a burn party. Yet, we're going to read it here in a minute, you'll still be saved. So what's up here with this, Pastor Kerry? I can do works, but if all the things I did was for the wrong reason, I'm still saved, I go in. That's right. You have no rewards, but you still have heaven. Everything we do is rewarded if it's good. Can you say amen? So we're going to see this. I love giving this illustration. You're going to see a lot of preachers who've been on TV, such as myself, and doing all these big works in God. And everybody's going to line up one by one and give an account of their life. So the big preacher's going to come up. And the whole life's going to go before him. And God's going to give him a little trinket for the reward. Oh, I went through all. I was the pastor and everything like that. He's, and, and Jesus will do something like this. He'll bring up this little intercessor named Peggy. And Peggy had been day and night on her knees praying for that church, for it to go and to prosper and to be in health. And between the pastor who preached the church and the little woman who prayed for the church, who do you think is going to get the biggest rewards? Right? The one that's no, not so visual. So you secret prayer warriors, guess what? You're getting lots of rewards being mounted up. And if you're not a secret prayer warrior, start. So we know gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. 
Gold, silver, precious stones are the things that you do in Jesus from your heart. Everyone say, my heart in Jesus. Jesus does good works, doesn't he? Now, the wood, hay, and stubble, what do you think that part is of your life? Flesh. It's your flesh. It's always between flesh and spirit. It never changes. Every problem in the New Testament, Old Testament, is flesh and spirit. Abel Cain. It's not that hard. Even a child can understand. We get all kabooberated because we're trying to figure it out on our own limited amount of knowledge. Instead, trust the Lord. Lean not to your own understanding. All your ways, just acknowledge that God is. Throughout the day, have fun with God. And he will direct your path. And right there in front of the devil, he's going to make you shine. And you're going to be like gold and silver and precious stones. And the devil is just going to curse you and, and pick on you. But you know what? He can't touch as long as you're with Christ. Now you get out on your own, he's going to whack you. I know, I've been whacked a couple of times. Come on, I'm telling you the truth. I got out ahead of God. Oh, yeah, God, hurry up. We do some darn things, don't we? It's crazy, crazy. Ah, God needs me. Have you ever said that? Well, sure, he needs you and he wants you. But he doesn't need you that much to get you all puffed up and hurt everybody. All right, so let's go on. Listen to this. Okay, so now if anyone builds on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it. What day? I was taught in Bible college, Scott, that the day is every day, and God tries you in every day, and he sees where your motives are. No, the day is the day that you stand before the Lord. Everyone say, the day I stand before Christ. That's the day he's talking about here. Now listen, listen to it. He says, now, each one's work will be clear. And now he says, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. Who's fire? Who's the fire? Our God is a consuming fire. fire. All right? So you're going to have all your works line right up with the consuming fire of Jesus Christ. You're going to stand right before him. Everything you did out of your selfishness will burn right up. Everything that you did for God and for others because you love them, you're going to have gold, silver, and precious stone rewards. Hello? Right in front of everybody, they're going to see your rewards. Boy, that also sobered me up because I figured, hey, the only thing that people are going to see that's a living testimony of my life is what remains after I see Jesus. Hello? I don't want on my tombstone, he left us a mess. <laughs> We want to leave something. Can you say amen? I want to leave, you know, if, if by chance the Lord comes and we all go and the church stays, I want it to continue to preach Jesus. Can you say amen? So we're going to stand before the Lord and everything that we've done, whether good or bad, is going to come to the fire. And then we're going to pass through Christ. Now we're not going to pass through fire like the fire like the evil people did because they wanted to mock God but they passed through Christ and whatever is done out of the pureness of your heart for God and for others will remain and God will reward you now didn't he say in my father's house are what I go to prepare a place for that where I am there you might be also huh 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 right so that mansion it's going to depend. This is a joke, Alan. This is a joke. You're either, either going to get a cabin, a cave, or a mansion. It depends on how your works are doing from this day forward. Because I found out this. Once you hear the truth, we're responsible for it. 
Say that with me. Once I hear the truth, I'm responsible for it. God will guide me and he will protect me. He will fill you. Why? Because you're trying your best to fulfill the, the word. He didn't even have to see you be perfect at it. Just do your best to do your best to follow God. And he will make up the difference. He will empower you when you fall short. As long as you keep going towards God. So let's find out how we get these rewards. Well, Pastor Kerry, I'm not sure where I stand right now. How do I make sure I... First thing you need to do is you need to say, watch and listen to how I say, Father, everything that I've done in my past that I have not even known was wrong. I haven't asked for forgiveness. I, I don't know anything about it, Lord. But what I'm asking is all of that crop failure, I pray, stops. And that I don't reap any of those negative things that I've sown here recently. But I ask for it to be a crop failure in Jesus' name. And Lord, set me on the right track. Folks, how many here wish you could gather back the words you spoke out of anger? Well, sure we do. So if you've ever spoken things out of anger, and we all have at times, God forbid, just simply say, Lord, I spoke without knowledge. Forgive me. I pull back those effects of those words so it won't lay in the conscience of those that dwell on negative things. Are you with me? Hello? I remember a preacher in California. He was a street preacher. He loved to go out on the street and witness. Well, one time his team didn't show up, so he was out on the street witnessing, and he was down in the prostitute section. And some of the ladies had known the teams down there, and they talked to the Christians and all that. So he was talking to one. She wanted to come to church, and she was asking them where the church was, how could I get there, would people treat me differently if I, they know I'm a street hooker and stuff like that. And he would say all that. But just then one of the gossips of the church drove by and saw him talking to a prostitute. And guess what she did? Oh, our pastor was talking to a hooker down there in the street. Now, you think that's a good work? That's why this is so important. You watch what you say about whom. If you don't have the facts, shut up. You don't know for sure, don't share your speculation unless you say, this is what I, I sense, this is my speculation, but I don't have any evidence. Say amen. Now, think of your life. Close your eyes and think of your life. How good are you at good works? Many of you are so good already. So I want to encourage you to continue that. And ask God within yourself, Lord, Teach me how to strain out the bad works, the waste of time works, with the works that are important. He will. Are you with me? So guess what? If your works are gold, you're going to be rewarded like gold. Your works are gold and silver, you're going to get gold, silver and precious stone. But there's a certain percentage of us, our works are really the flesh. Hello? Hello? And whether you, you know it or not, no flesh is going to get into the kingdom anymore. So you're going to be stopped right at the gate, stand right before Jesus, and he's going to analyze you, and then he's going to let you go in. Now, how many of you remember the story? We're going to read it here in a minute. Where you stand before Christ, and there's going to be some tears. Remember that? There's going to be some tears. What are those tears for, Pastor Kerry? That's when you see you could have done better, and you didn't. God will wipe the tears away right quickly and then you'll enter in the joy of the Lord and get your rewards. Say amen. Now, there are going to be people that are just going to get barely in. I, I don't know who that is. I don't know why that is. But people who are truly saved but they never did one thing for God. Are they going to get rewarded? Other than a salvation crown? No. No. They made it. No. So we don't know. For the people that don't get the rewards, what happens? We know they, they are saved, yet so by far. So let's read this. Say, I want to know how good my works are. So I got to talk to God. 
I'm not going to tell you. Certainly I can't. All right, listen to the rest of this, okay? And so each one's work will be tested by fire, okay? Of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a what? A reward. See, you do receive rewards. But then it says, if anyone's work is burnt, he will suffer what? Loss. But he himself shall be what? Yeah, so it's not talking about sinners going up before God. It's talking about born-again believers going up and answering how obedient and how disobedient they were. Hello? Close your eyes and ask God, how obedient and how disobedient am I? And if you hear nothing for a while, it's okay. <laughs> because God's always going to encourage you. He's never going to say one bad thing about you. He might say, hey, we'll work on it together or something. But you see what I'm saying? He never leaves you by yourself. He's so smart. He saves you just the way you are. But he's smart enough not to leave you that way. Can you say amen? <laughs> all right, so let's look at this. So we are fellow workers with all these other Christians. We are God's field. We are God's building. We are God's uh, uh, very seed that he puts in us. Secondly, Jesus Christ is the foundation for our feet. Walk on him. Walk through him. Walk by him. But don't walk ahead of him or behind him. Get up in the morning, meet with him, get in tune, and then you and Jesus walk out your day. It's that simple. That simple and yet profound. Are you with me? So Jesus Christ, the foundation for our feet, he is the rock, the unshakable foundation of our life. What we do throughout our life is set up on whether we do it in Christ or do it in the flesh. Gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble. Thirdly, our God is that consuming fire. And we will do everything that we can. We make that commitment. What we do has to be in love. Love for others because the value of our rewards are based on love. Now abideth faith, hope, and love or charity, right? And the greatest of these is what? Why? God is love. Love, the kind of love he describes, agape love, is God and God is love. So therefore, if you let God of love out of you in the works that you do, you're going to get gold, silver, and precious stone. If you resent the fact that you're an usher and you've got to pass out communion, you're going to get zip dingle for that particular act. You get up in the morning and somebody says, I need a ride to work. Can you give me a ride? And you go, ah. you're going to get a zip and dingle and God will probably make you do it anyway. But you get up and say, oh Lord, well, okay, God will see that he'll take care of this. Because your heart is innocent, childlike, and God rewards that effort in your heart. He doesn't reward you when the project's done. He rewards you throughout the project as it being done because you're doing it in love for others. Say amen. So we pass through our God in that judgment day. And whatever we've done for the Lord will remain. Whatever we've done for ourselves will burn up. Yet we'll still be saved by fire. Say amen. Now go to James with me again. James chapter 2, verse 21. Almost done with you. Verse 21, James 2. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? What's the answer? Yes. Abraham believed God, didn't he? And his works showed that he believed God. God said, your son, Isaac, I'm going to affect the entire world with him. He's going to be as the 
Stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. Stars of the sky, spiritual born-again Christians through the faith of Abraham. And sand of the sea, natural Jews of the earth, earthly. Right? And so here God says, now, check you out there, Abraham. Remember, this is the Old Testament. God doesn't do this in the New Testament. But he does it in the Old Testament. He says, Abraham, you take your only son whom I promised you would change the world with, and you take him up and sacrifice him to me. Now, what are you going to do? Do you believe God? Or you go, because we don't have a relationship with, oh, God, why did you ask me to do that? And that's where a lot of Christians are today. We have all this time to meet with God and get to know him. And when God asks something hard of them, they don't operate in faith. They complain. But Abraham believed God. And you know the story, don't you? He says, hey, I and the lad are going to go up and we're going to make a sacrifice up in the hills. And he got the wood and, and he got all of the fire elements and everything like that. And then, of course, oops, my foot got caught there. And then, and then Isaac says, hey, hey but dad, where's the sacrifice? Isaac was a sacrifice. Okay? Now, you think of this. Why would God ask Abraham, who he made the promises to, to offer his son? Here's the answer. Say, I want to know the answer. Because who offered his son for us? Abraham, you really believe me? Take your son up and offer him as a sacrifice. He didn't say, kill your son. So take him up and offer him. Just because you offer something doesn't mean God takes it away from you. If you think about it, when we offer God our car, he blesses it. When we offer God our family, he blesses it. He doesn't take it away from us. So Abraham, when he was talking to his servants, say, I and the lad are going up to offer a sacrifice. And when we return, he says, when we return. So he knew his God wouldn't require him to do that. Hello. Do you know your God so well that when he asks you to do something that you will believe that he will equip you to do it and you won't doubt him on the way? Then you're on your way to maturity. Hello. Good works which God has created in you to produce good works. So he says, Abraham offered his son Isaac. Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect or mature. That the scripture was fulfilled, it says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Folks, when you begin to settle down and learn to trust God, God can be your friend. Because he's not going to think at any moment you're going to get up and stab somebody or act kind of weird and act out. Once you walk with God for a while, he gets to know all of your attributes and you get comfortable enough to understand your confidence in God. And then there isn't any more what I call herky-jerky Christianity. You know what a herky-jerky person does? <laughs> up, down, in and up. Herky-jerky Christianity is when you obey God when all is good, and when it's not so good, you want to do your own thing. Hypocrite? You're in the flesh. Get out of it. You're not taking the flesh with you. Remember, we're not taking this with us. We get to shed the cocoon. You're the butterfly on the inside. You are. This isn't the real you. That's why you make it up, make it try to look pretty, keep it from, you know, bathe it, whatever. But that isn't the real you. You know what the real you is? Right down in your core of your heart with God in it. That's you. So catch this. Likewise, was not Rahab. Who was Rahab in the Bible? She was a prostitute. Why is she listed as a woman of faith? I thought God didn't like sin. 
Answer me this. Why did God consider her a righteous woman? Yet she was a hooker. This will set you free. Because God is not interested in what your life was. He's interested in what your life will become with him. Because that's the original plan, you know. We were supposed to be with God. We weren't supposed to have this devil guy. We weren't supposed to die. We weren't supposed to do any of that. And now that we are, we better learn how to deal with it. Oh, happy day. <laughs> oh, hap That's right, we have to deal with it. Carrie, do you get up in the morning and worry about anything? Not at all. Not no more. Did you ever? Oh, yeah. I worried about everything I didn't give to God. And so do you. Look at Job. Did you like that little story on Job I gave you there, Alan? Look at Job. Job was so caught up in what he was doing, he didn't have time to really relate to God like he needed to. So he married a woman that wasn't saved. How many women you know that are saved says, curse God and die? Huh. Hello? Not only that, but the women trained the children, so the children were out partying all the time while Job was out there in the fields working. And, of course, he would dwell and devil would fill his head, and he'd worry. So he'd constantly, every day, be sacrificing for his kids and his wife and all the things he worried about. Instead, he should have just gave them all to God and says, clean it up, God, please. Yet when God talked to the devil about, about Job, he said, there's none like him in all the earth. He's a righteous man. And we just got through talking about Rahab, the prostitute. And now we talk about Job, who married all these problems. And God, as far as he's concerned, his kids are righteous. Now, he knows better, but he looks at us that way. He doesn't look, Scott, at you the next time you're going to blow it. <laughs> I'm watching that Scott guy. Any day now, he might go off. He doesn't look at us that way at all. He doesn't wait for us to stumble. He gave you the goods, didn't he? What do you, who do you have? You have the goods on you. So how could God give you all of his goods and then anoint you and appoint you and get you forgiven and think you're going to fail? He believes in you. He knows you can fail, but he believes that you're going to trust him. Say amen. And finishing. Abraham loved God and believed God, and he knew no matter what happened to Isaac, he would have that promise. Can you say amen? What do we do? Either we do a labor with complaint or we do a labor of love. Which one do we get rewarded on? Amen. Did you know you get rewarded for showing up to a Bible study? You don't get rewarded by staying home and thinking of yourself? Now, I don't believe you should be at every Bible study, but I do believe you should offset the negativity of the world by getting enough word in you. Can you say amen? To offset the negative narrative that Satan is painting in this world. We need the word. Can you say amen? So every work that's done by a Christian is either good or it is not so good. It either burns up or it remains. Let's make a decision. We're going to have things remain. Can you say amen? We're going to not speak so rashly and think about what we say. And before we make a decision, we're going to pray about it. Say amen. And then fourthly, the very sobering thought to know that we're being rewarded by what we do. So if we're being rewarded and I need a pay raise, what should I do? Watch how I do it better. Can you say amen? You see, this works so wonderfully. 
You have need of something. Let's say you have need of clothes. So you give some clothes away. Guess what? Clothes show up. What happened? I gave some vitamins away the other day because this person wasn't taking vitamins and I just gave my best vitamins. And these are chewy gummies, all has all the good stuff in it for silver people, you know. And so I just gave it brand new and everything like that. Well, a week later, I got three my vitamins back. And you go, wow, what, what causes all that? That's just what God does. The idea is that you were so used to you doing everything. Now that when God wants to set you up, you still want to get involved and mess things up. God, I want you to bless me, but it has to be this way. How many's ever got blessed and answered to prayer, but he did it a different way than you thought he could? That's our God. When we get there, what will happen, Pastor Kerry? Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 9, and 10, and we'll finish with this. When we get there, what's the first thing that's happened? You're not going to see your relatives. You're not going to shake Abraham's hand. <laughs> You're going to stand right before Christ in the most loving, beautiful creature you ever saw in your life, your Lord and Savior. And you're going to fall more and more deeply in love with him. And then your whole life is going to pass right there in the instant of time. Everything that you've done out of the wrong reason is just going to go away and just burn right up. You won't sense it. You will have a few tears. but You'll see the things you could have, should have, maybe would have done. But you, you can't change that now. So God will wipe that away and give you joy where that sorrow was. And you'll enter the joy of the Lord. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. For you've been... Faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over much. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You see? That's heaven. So you will be rewarded. So let's make sure our rewards are good now from this day forward. What we say, what we do, let's, let's make sure. And you know, the devil can't stop you. I mean, since when did the devil ever put one over on Jesus. Has he ever pulled one over on Jesus? But he confronted Jesus during the temptation, didn't he? But he didn't pull anything over on Jesus, did he? Well, who lives in you? Well, then let him rule. Let him reign. And nobody's going to pull anything on you either. Amen. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. I just love it. I'll have a salesman come up to my porch and he goes through this spiel and everything and, and then God will tell me what to ask him and I'll ask him the one question he hadn't considered which exposes the whole con. You see, if you rely on God, he has a good way of doing things without residual damage. Residual damage is what I meant to say. All right, so let's look at this. So 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10 says, Therefore, we make it our aim. This is our purpose right now. Whether present with God or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things. Now listen, these are rewards. Receive the things done in the body according to what is done, whether good or bad. Remember I told you, God rewards good. The things that you did wrong, he just neutralizes them. Can you say amen? Yeah, he neutralizes them. Lord, everything that I said in the last two weeks that were not of you, neutralize. Yeah, because you, your head has thoughts and you might catch yourself making a comment. Don't get all caught up in that. Just when you meet with God, get all that washed, cleansed. Say amen. 1 Corinthians 3, 8, listen to this. Now we who plants and he who waters are one. So you might plant, I might water. I might water, you might plant. But each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So God's got your personal ticket and your personal paycheck in rewards. Can you say amen? 
Romans 14, listen to this one. 10 through 13. But why do you judge your brother? Don't do that anymore. Or why do you show contempt to your brother? You are this color and you are that color. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this in ourselves that we cause no one to stumble. So let's say, for example, you are a vegetarian and you invite me over for dinner. I should go and eat whatever you place before me without complaint. I shouldn't show up, Linda, at your doorstep with a steak hanging out of my mouth. Going, you can eat all the vegetables you want, but I'm having steak. You see, you've you now taken something good and you offend people by it. Like for the, here's one. How many ever wish a blessing on someone? Hey, be blessed today. Right? And they come back with, I am. <laughs> we all do it. Just say, oh yeah, you blessing me? Keep it coming. Don't be so proud to say, I'm blessed. You're just letting everybody know that you had to fight for that blessing and you're going to hold on to it no matter what. <laughs> if I say bless you, don't say he does. That's kind of dumb. Of course he does. I want him to bless you more. I'm praying that you all prosper and be in health. I pray that you get rich, that you get good things. Why? Because you are Christians. You love God. You're going to do what's right with money, with people. Can you say amen? So God wants us to prosper so we can affect the earth. Folks, if you're a pauper and haven't got any money, you're not going to affect very much. But if you can write a $10,000 check because you can and because God asked you to, you're going to change things. Now, may you all become like that. Do you fault me because I want you to prosper? Well, God's never going to prosper us beyond our ability. Well, yeah, of course. So let's get you to understand more of the principles of the word. So when God does give you a big chunk of a blessing, you won't waste it on yourself. You can't outgive God, folks. He, the Bible says, he that lends to the poor lends to the Lord and God will repay him. So if you know that to be true, try to outgive God. Well, you can't. March of Dimes. How many here heard of the March of Dimes? The guy was dying. He could have died at any day. But the Lord laid on his heart that he was going to take a bunch of his money and lay it on the street sidewalk, dime at a time, touching each other, as far as he could spend all that money. And before he could get a couple blocks around, he was healed. And that's where the March of Dimes came from. You guys don't know that because we don't know our history. We need to look for the good things. Hello. Our government, tithing and giving. They started a tithing program right after World War I. I mean, excuse me, right after World War II in, in wheat. They were going to start giving other countries lots of wheat and stuff like that and begin to claim a return. We ended up with so much wheat, we had to tell the farmers, hey, we're going to pay you not to grow any. So we need to take God's principles above and beyond anything that we ask or think. We need to begin to believe and trust God, say amen, and begin to do the works that God has asked us to do because we know rewards are coming, but not only in the life to come, but in this life. If you got a good prayer life, people are going to see it on you. People that pray a lot are hardly upset about anything because God is first. Well, with that in mind, we will all stand before the Lord. 
So today on, we have now been informed that with God's help, we can score high on our rewards list. If you got some uh, that we give the Lord a hand clap, will you?